Hi, is this Nancy? Yes, it is. All right. Well, let me do the official introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, we are very excited to welcome our guest for this evening. She is a friend. She is our boss. And she is a writer and editor and at the helm of Videoscope Magazine. We are very excited to welcome Miss Nancy Naglin to the show. You're on the air, Nancy. Welcome. Well, great. It's great to be here with you tonight. You know, it's so interesting, Nancy. I was telling uh, Tiffany here that I only talked to Joe once. And that was on the show. <laughs> and now I'm doing the same thing with you. I've only talked to you once, and it's on the show. <laughs> I know. That is, that is something. And we've had such a long friendship as well. Yes. I know. Yeah. I know. That's for sure. When I, came, when I came back into the studio, I told Terry, I was like, I think that's the first time I've ever talked to Nancy on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for spending your Christmas with us. It's, I know it's late in New York. No, it's a pleasure. It's really a pleasure. I've been looking forward to this. Uh, you know, relaunching uh, Videoscope, yeah. uh, it's been quite a, it's, well, it's been quite an adventure. Um, and just uh, as we come to the end of this month, uh, the magazine is getting ready to go to press, and I'm, I'm pleased it was a, a real effort by the whole Videoscope editorial team. Uh, we put together a really terrific issue. It will be out in, uh, on sale on, on January 14th in Barnes, on all the Barnes & Noble stores. Um, we've had uh, such su such support from our advertisers and our writers. When I contacted them and told them I we were going to start up again, uh, they responded with joy. It was mm -hmm. just great. Well, I have to tell you, Nancy, uh, I was saying on the show uh, before we got you on the phone that uh, I don't know if you know this about Terry, but he's really bad at keeping secrets really bad and when you came to us and told us that it was coming back and asked if we wanted to be involved which of course we did but you you had asked us not to say anything i was like oh god this is going to be really hard to not say anything but so when you finally announced the relaunch on on social media we sighed a collective sigh of relief that we were like okay we don't have to try to keep the secret anymore <laughs> i didn't i didn't let it out i promise nancy i didn't let <laughs> no, it out no no you didn't you no. didn't um the, the reason i i had said that to you was um I wanted you to know because obviously if you're going to contribute, uh, you want to start thinking about h how and what, what uh, articles would be good. But at the time, I needed to uh, contact all the uh, subscribers. Yeah. I mm -hmm. wanted them to hear first uh, f from Videoscope that they, w where they were with their subscription. And I wanted to also reach out to all our advertisers. That was key. And uh, again, I want to repeat the, the uh, enthusiasm and support, the good wishes from the advertisers was really, I have to tell you, it was overwhelming. It showed me that over the years, the uh, magazine that Joe conceived and he put out, uh, just like clockwork, four times a year uh, uh, since 95, and before that, you know, we were in the news, we were a bi-monthly newsletter, right. uh, they had come to... Um, uh, they'd come to, 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 to know that when we said we were going to publish, when we would make our deadlines, they, they knew we would respect it. And so their, re their response was just so reassuring, and they, they've all come back. They, they want to participate. Now, even though everyone was loyal, am I right in knowing that I saw on your Facebook page there was a lot of people that, even though they wanted to believe, wasn't sure that you weren't hacked and thought it was a joke? You know, I saw a couple of those postings, too. And uh, I, I remember reading one guy's comment, and he said, is, 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 have I been hacked? I mean, I just <laughs> got a, a, a letter about my subscription. Is, is this for real? Yeah. And, and uh, one of our writers, I think it was Rob Freeze, I think he, he jumped in and answered and said, believe it, it's real. Right, <laughs> right, right. Now, yeah. I w we'll, of course, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the inception of Videoscope, but one of the things that that I was really grateful for, and I wanted to ask, I'm, I'm happy that you made this decision, but I wanted to ask if you ever had dis had thought about not, because I thought it was great that not only is Videoscope relaunching, but you're keeping it in print. You're keeping a physical magazine that people can hold because in this day and age, everybody goes digital and it's, you know, it's easier. You don't have printing costs. Was that ever something that you had ever considered? I think it's great that Videoscope is relaunching and it's still going to be a tangible magazine that you can hold on to. Well, um, that's a really interesting question because uh, initially, um, be, while I was mulling over the idea about uh, to relaunch and in what format, I did explore uh, some online versions. And the more I thought about it, I realized that what our, our subscribers uh, and even some of our advertisers, old-fashioned as it is, print advertising, 
they uh, they prefer print. And I wasn't sure if some of our people were going to migrate and, and be as enthusiastic about Videoscope if it was in another format. Right. And so um, in consultation with our art director, uh, our press, uh, our distributors, the key thing is the distributors, uh, when all that was in place and I realized, yes, this is feasible, we can go back and can just pick up and continue the format that, our, that, people are, that people associate with Videoscope, it's going to work. Then I threw myself back into print. And what you said is so true because one of the advantages of online or, is that there is, no, there is no exacting word count. I mean, if, if you have a long article, you can just run with it. You can just keep posting. You don't have... Uh, the, the the page is its own physical constraint. There's so many so re, so many reviews you can put on a page, mm -hmm. and it has to be fitted in. So that that is uh, one of the more old fashioned things about print. But yep, we're a print magazine. Not Video only is print. Not only are you the bravest woman I've ever known, <laughs> but you're you're very qualified because you're so lucky. You weren't just a housewife. <laughs> you're you're an you're an editor. You're a writer. You're a publisher. You put out your own books. So you've got all this background. I bet you thank God so much that you have all that knowledge to not just be Joe's spouse, his partner in life, but to know that you know maybe almost as much as Joe and are very qualified to do this. Well, let me tell you, uh, we were very fortunate. First, um, uh, when we first met, one of the first things we did was go to a movie and eat Chinese food. I mean, that's what we, <laughs> that was our idea of. Uh, that's a perfect evening, and yeah. we found out very quickly that uh, a lot of our uh, interests in film overlapped. And I, and I want to state unequivocally that Joe's knowledge of film was truly extensive. Yeah. And not only did he uh, acquire this from childhood and into adolescence and then as a, a college student, uh, but all his life he was learning about film, studying it, looking at reference books, comparing different genres, different eras, thinking about uh, how films are alike, how they differ. He could, for example, walk, if you had the TV on, he could walk through the living room, pause if a movie was on. He would turn to me and he would state the name of the film, the director. <laughs> he would give a one or two synopsis of what the plot was, maybe one interesting uh cast member or some reason it was important and if it was good he would be a little regretful and i said well come watch it and he would say no i have to see it from the beginning yeah and if it was if it was crappy he would say to me how can you watch this <laughs> <laughs> but but one of the things that we shared was we started as writers and uh, while joe had an interest in writing about film a lot of the work that he was writing when i first met him it was um he was writing satire, fiction, comic strips even, uh, humor pieces, uh, freelancing like crazy before he got the gig at the New York Daily News. Yeah. And then, uh, of course, film was his main focus. But I can say that we were very fortunate in, the, in, in this way. When we started uh, Videoscope, it came about this way. Uh, the, uh, Joe's... Uh, uh, Two things happened. It was the it was uh, the beginning of desktop publishing, and everybody was excited about it. Right. This idea that you didn't have to buy type, you could do your own magazine, um, a zine or whatever. Everybody wanted to get into it. And the other thing that was happening was uh, the strength of the newspapers was beginning to weaken. the The Daily News went through uh, some very serious strikes, changes of ownership, and Joe was put on hiatus for like about three months and, the, and they, w they just said it's not that we want to stop your column but the paper is in the throes of being disintegrated and reinvented financially and during that time um, this, your, your columns are going to stop and that really was the wake up call we decided we had been working on video scope but it was a side project and uh, I got very serious about it at that time and said to Joe you know we really could build this into something viable uh, our own uh, uh, entity that's separate from the news, and I think we should start to pay more attention to it. Right. So Joe began to think about about it uh, editorially, and I began to think about a better distribution and uh, a better uh, uh, periodical postage, a lot of the things uh, that are tedious but necessary to get a business up and running. So we, we really work well together. Now you have this writing background, but I read on your Facebook page you started studying law. That is a, comp I don't know where that came from. Really? It's a mistake. 
I don't. I, I guess I should go down there and edit it out. I <laughs> never entered that information. I was stunned to learn that I had studied law. Never. I, I never studied law in my life. I have a degree. I I have a degree in English literature, and yeah. so did Joe. And uh, this is also interesting. Joe went to Queens College. And I went to McGill University in Montreal, and when we met, uh, we compared notes, you know, as you get to know each other, and each of us had won uh, a writing award in our last year of college, and we both laughed because it was a cash award. We each got the same amount of money. I got uh, $500, and so did he. It, this, to me, was a fortune, and it was based on writing, and we yeah. both laughed because we both agreed. That's what set us going on a writing career, thinking, hey, this could be easy. <laughs> <laughs> How did how did he think of the entity of Phantom of the Movies? Well, um, he first of all, let me say he loved being the Phantom of the Movies. It <laughs> appealed to everything in his personality. Yeah. He loved the the anonymity, uh, and he loved the the joke and the anonymity. And uh, the news at that time, when they launched the column, uh, they they um, they put out a lot of. Uh, uh, match little matches like you could get a phantom a little a packet of phantom matches. Oh, mm-hmm. cool. all you had to do was write to the news and they would send you one. Yeah. And everybody wanted to collect them. And they're lo- they're lovely little collectors items. It says Phantom of the Movies, uh, and he looks similar to the logo that's in the magazine. And on the back it said, "Is he sitting next to you?" <laughs> <laughs> So Joe just loved this game of it. Yeah. And uh, wh- how it happened was uh, they came up with the concept of Phantom of the Movies, and he said, I'm all for it. I'm in. And and then uh, with the passage of time, uh, as the video came, first he was just reviewing uh, the Phantom would go to theaters. That was the whole uh, kick in it. He would go to a theater and review the theater and the movie. But then when theatrical was... Uh, also, uh, alongside the introduction of video, then he started to write another column called Mondo Video, mm. and he started to review stuff that was for home entertainment. Right. Right. And then, as time went on, the whole concept of a, of a masked secret phantom sort of lost its appeal, and some other uh, people wanted to interview him, and little by little, uh, uh, people knew that he was uh, Joe Kane, the Phantom of the Movies. But let me just add this quick. Prior to becoming the Phantom of the Movies, Joe uh, had... Uh, uh, a tenured career that, that that in hindsight is luminous, and that is he was the editor of the Monster Times. Yeah. Right. And he was the only editor of the Monster Times for all of the issues, 48 issues. And when he was uh, just made Phantom and started to write uh, a couple of columns, he got a letter from uh, one of the editors at the Monster Times, who at the time was like an intern. He was a college student who used to go up to the Monster Times and work there, and it, it started his career. And he wrote this letter to Joe, and he said it was very well written. Basically, he's saying, I don't care what anybody says. There's only one person in the world that can write that column, and it is Joe Kane. I know you are the Phantom. Tell me I'm not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, uh, he was right, because Joe developed some of that wordplay and style, and he had an intimacy uh, about his writing about uh the, the topic, and he developed a lot of that at the Monster Times. Well, you for sure are a part of Joel. You are his right hand. You are part of him. You're his heart. You're his soul. But like when Famous Monsters of Filmland relaunched, they tried to infuse it with the wit and wisdom of Forey Ackman. How are you going to infuse Joe into the relaunch of Videoscope, or are you, and if so, how are you? Oh, what a great, great question. And I can tell you, you, this question hits the nerve because you can't replicate uh, uh, Joe's voice. I agree. But but Joe's uh, vision is the heart and soul of Videoscope, and that's what we're honoring. And initially, I had trepidation, thinking, I'm not Joe, I'm not the Phantom, and I I don't aspire to be the Phantom, but I aspire to to continue... uh, the creation that he created. And then uh, while I'm thinking about this and being very nervous about it, I pick up the New York Times and I read an article about, of all things, Warhol's Interview Magazine. Oh. And Warhol's Interview Magazine is still around. It's still in, it's still in print. Oh. Nice. And the editor, that they're, the point of the article is the introducing the new editor who's just taking the reins. And this person from his uh, the age they give of him and when he was born, he's in his 40s. And he's saying that the most important decade for him is the 70s, when, of course, he was just a child, if, if, it, if at all. And he uh, is uh, channeling 
the feel of the 70s updated to wrap around everything else that in, that's kept Interview Magazine going all these years. And uh, it gave me tremendous confidence thinking that a good publication that is honest to its core mission can evolve and change after the initial founder is no longer here to, to, to direct things. So one of the ways that I'm planning to keep the essence and the spirit of Joe going is because of the nature of the material, there are a lot of re-releases of films that Joe initially re reviewed. So just just to have a flavor of Joe, yeah. I'm, I'm running, uh, if a film comes out uh, that he initially reviewed, uh, I will run a small review uh, so his work will be will be present, his voice will be present. Uh, and then we're keeping a lot of the same, uh, the, the, the subject matter is the same. And um, the good thing is, as the magazine matured, uh, his wasn't the only voice. This, the editorial team uh, would uh, provide a lot, of, uh, a lot of options of interest. I mm -hmm. mean, some people pre prefer certain writers over others or certain topics over others. And we had experts in a, in a lot of areas. Right, right. Now, let me ask you, I mean, I know that, that you've said that a lot of the writers and things have come back with with resounding uh, enthusiasm. A lot of the, the advertisers have come back with resounding enthusiasm. Um, what kind of feedback have you gotten so far, not only from previous subscribers, but also uh, are you finding a, a new impetus of, of new readers? Because it, it's kind of it's old but it's kind of new with this relaunch well um what's interesting about our our subscribers uh, they're quite loyal mm -hmm. and a lot of them when they um uh replied some of them had to renew their subscriptions and other people uh not yet but i got uh this was very um uh, heartening i got a lot of personal notes and letters of support and, and condolence yes. and yes. also people people expressing um, uh, a feeling that they had lost uh, a friend. A lot of people wrote, while I never met Joe, I felt I knew him through yes. his writing. Uh, and they talked about topics that were of interest to them. Um, and it was it's kind of the, the subject matter for certain people who read Videoscope, it's kind of like you're in a shared club. Mm -hmm. uh, you share these interests, and it's exciting to hear someone else uh, uh, talk about reanimator, for example, if that's your interest, or it it it, it it's significant. It's more than, and we of course cover n new releases. Um, so we got. A, a, I would say a, the response from the from the uh, subscribers has been good. Getting new subscribers has always been um, difficult for us. It's word of mouth. It's through Facebook some, right. um, and. Uh, it's always exciting when someone discovers Videoscope for the first time and has the reaction of, where has this been all my life? Yeah. Right. Well, I have to tell you, one of the things that, that I had experienced from, from other, other readers, uh, of which you know a, a, quite a few Videoscope readers uh, have come over and become listeners of ours because they found out about us in Videoscope. Um, and, and one of the comments that was made uh, that really struck me, I had never really thought about that before, is they they had referred to to Joe in his not necessarily in his look or his behavior, but in his in his style of doing things as being punk. And what they meant by that is that he he went to the beat of his own drum. He was you know a startup. We can do it. Let's do it this way or that way. And I have to say that. And he, he wasn't necessarily you know it wasn't all about what was trendy at the time. And I have to say that the one thing that Terry and I always loved about Joe is that he was always very grassroots and he was always very supportive. I remember when we launched uh, Cult Radio like 20 years ago, uh, we had told him about it and we were kind of like, oh, is he not going to like this because, you know, we're getting interviews for the radio show too, so are we kind of being competition? But Joe was completely 100% supportive and in and he was like, nope, let's put it in the magazine. He was He was fantastic about it. Joe, yes, Joe definitely. That was his, he. Joe was very expansive. In other words, it wasn't like he was controlling some small fee, uh, fief or turf. And uh, and also from being at the news, um, uh, he he uh, he was approached all the time by people who had uh, 
especially back in the day, straight to you know, uh, films that went straight to video. Would you talk about my film? And he would he would uh, uh, take a look at a lot of these things. And one of the things that um, he got, a lot of people were sending him zines. Hmm. And um, I've since learned that these zines have become quite collectible. Zines yeah. from the eighties and nineties. Uh, they're one of a kind. They're unique. Joe um, had quite a collection. We weren't. Uh, we weren't avid collectors. What we what we were is people who were so ha- so quick to move on to the next issue, the next project that we never threw anything out. It was like, uh, who has time to go through with it? <laughs> right. Can we uh. can we just get it out of the way? So because we got a whole new box of other stuff to go right. through. So we weren't, um, you know, collectors in the sense of oh these treasured deans. It was like oh, can we maybe get them and put them up under the attic? Because look look all the new videos that have come. Right. And right. then, uh, but Joe. Um, uh, some of the writers have said that as well. He was very encouraging to writers. Uh, his his attitude was there's there's plenty of stuff to go around. It's a wonderful topic. It's it, let's share all the enthusiasms. You talk about collectability and what things become worth, like zines and so forth. We looked up his Night of the Living Dead book on eBay. It's going for like seven hundred dollars. Are you serious? I'm yeah. serious. Yeah, I actually have a, a, another close friend of mine is a Night of the Living Dead fanatic and i was like oh well for for a holiday present i think i'll get him a copy of joe's book because we only have one copy and i wasn't going to give him mine i mean i like this guy (laughs) but i'm not giving him mine and so i looked it up on on the internet and because it's out of print like you can get a copy but it's anywhere from five to seven hundred dollars I must look into this. This is extraordinary. Yeah. I had no idea. This is truly extraordinary. You know, while we're speaking of Night of the Living Dead, uh, let me tell you this. Uh, this something wonderful has happened, and, and it's been finalized, and I'm announcing this in the in video scope, in the winter video scope. But the University of Pittsburgh is where George Romero's uh, papers and archive is. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've been in touch with the University of Pittsburgh, and they have acquired Joe's papers and archives and... Uh, the zines and uh, the, the Joe's collection of his Monster Times, his copies, and they're also going to be digitizing VideoScope to make it available for research. Okay. Right. And uh, this is all going to happen uh, in the next year. They'll be getting all these materials. I, I couldn't be happier. Yeah. Now, could you tell our listeners a, a little bit about, in case they hadn't heard about it, uh, I understand that there's going to be an installation at a college in, that kind of goes over VideoScope and, and some of Joe's work, right? Well, that would be initially. Uh, I had thought it was going somewhere else, but that's going to. That's what we're talking about ah, at University okay. of Pittsburgh. Awesome! It's going to be at University of Pittsburgh. Um, as as, as VideoScope is concerned, uh, they will digitize it and make it available through their library system to scholars, people who want to do film research. Nice. And uh, of course, the legalities of it are: I I retain the copyrights and can continue to publish as long as we as we continue to publish. And at some future time, um, they will be in charge of video scope in terms of um, uh, making sure that it has longevity and that it has value to scholars and people who want to. Uh, as time goes on, I think people will want to look at the 80s and see uh, that's a very exciting decade for home entertainment and to see uh, how views change, what was put out. And also, uh, Joe commented on quite a bit of that contemporaneously in his in his news columns. Um, you know, you mentioned something about Joe's uh, his uh, imprint style and personality. Mm-hmm. One of the things that he uh, that came naturally to him and was kind of gutsy was that uh, he was a, he was uh, he was never he was a very stylized writer. He had a flair, but he had a, an attitude that was irreverent. Yeah, but right. it was it was cheeky. Yeah. It, it was <clears throat> fun cheek. It was pith. It wasn't um, mean, and it wasn't. Um, uh, to to, to uh, knock people down, but he would have wordplay, and uh, he, in his columns, I, I even had a laugh when I reread some of his news columns. He would go to these these real flea pits at Times Square or out in the uh, boroughs, and he would say something like, uh, "The Phantom nearly broke his neck going down the steps into the dungeon like <laughs> gloom." Uh, so be careful when you go there. It's only two two dollars, and you be sure you don't have any insurance. I mean, he was very um, uh, blunt about just. Just, uh, uh, but in but in a in a very nice good writing right. style. Well, maybe it goes in with what Tiffany said about punk, but I saw the photo somewhere on Facebook to where he's he's on a, a pier or he's standing in front of the ocean or something in New York, 
And he looks like, to me, Lou Reed. <laughs> Seriously. Well, I, uh, you know, um, there are some... Uh, when he was younger, in the 70s, uh, he, he uh, cultivated a certain New York look. Yeah. Uh, this is what he looked like when I met him. He, he of course, always wore sunglasses. Um, he usually wore uh, jeans. Uh, he wore uh, a black shirt. Uh, usually, uh, he wore a leather jacket, always for his reviewing. Um, he went, and everywhere he went, he, he, he in, in that jacket, he always had a pencil and a, a little folded scrap of paper so he could take <laughs> notes in the theater. Perfect. And um, uh, he had a very, uh, uh, I don't know, it was a cross between a beat and a kind of Lou Reed type uh, underground yeah, type look. And uh, it could be intimidating, but the truth was he was a very approachable, uh, friendly kind of guy. He was now, easygoing. As, as we go through this, I'm getting uh, questions from the listeners, uh, so I'll kind of pepper them in here. Uh, if there's anything that they ask that you don't want to answer, you don't have to, because I know that part of publishing is kind of keeping you know your, your poker hand close to your chest. But one of these questions is uh, that came from the audiences are wanting to know if you can give any kind of a hint as far as the next one or two issues, as uh, what featured interviews or upcoming content or themes are going to be? Oh, okay, that's a great question. Um, let's see. Uh, in the uh, in the winter issue, uh, we have um, uh, the winter issue is a winter chills issue. We have some Fulci, we have some Bravo Baba reviews, uh, we have uh, Larry Hankin Part Two. Uh, we like uh, the previous issue. We interviewed him. Uh, we're picking up and finishing that interview. Um, we have a sci-fi file. We're reviewing some science fiction stuff. Uh, we have um, uh, a column called Horrorama, where we look at some of the, the, the standards, like the Curse of Frankenstein, Doctor X. And in the spring issue, the spring issue, we're going to do something we haven't done in a long while, which is going to be an action issue. We're going to look back at some of the action of the, of the 70s and 80s, some kung fu. Uh, we do have uh, an interview with um, uh, uh, Yuzna from Reanimator. Uh, so it's, that, that also is going to be pretty jam-packed with reviews. Now, I know when you told us you said you wanted to do more action because you've done some of that in the past. You wanted to, to open up the magazine a little wider to a broader scope. Other than action, is there anything that you're thinking about putting into the magazine, uh, making it part of it that, that maybe we hadn't seen so much of or hadn't seen at all before? Oh, that's a good question. Well, we're keeping some of the the core the core things are pretty much the same. Um, um, I would say that uh, I would say that uh, we're pretty much the same. Uh, what we did do, what we did do, and I think people will be pleased with this is. Uh, uh, new print technologies have come along, and we have a slight redesign. Uh, it, so, so some of the pages are a little uh, different headlines, mm -hmm. but all in keeping with the video scope look. Right. Um, so the next question from the audience is: uh, They're wanting to know. They said uh, video scope really saw the boom of the home video uh, environment, um, and now that everything's going digital. How does that change video scope? Are you concerned about the progression of less movies in theaters and more being on streaming? Oh, I'm really glad someone has asked that question because uh, you you had previously asked me, well, how, well, how does this uh, relaunch of this particular issue differ in terms of content? Uh, we've addressed that. We could see that that was, is the way things are going uh, in, in the last while, and that is the future. So we're running a new column called Grindhouse streaming, which will give you uh, uh, ideas about what's out there to, 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 uh, in Grindhouse that you can, that you can uh, uh, go and see. And we're beginning to, as more things are uh, video on demand or uh, from streaming, we're continuing to review that and telling people where we saw it and where they can go access it. And also, one of the things that we're doing in the winter issue is a lot of our advertisers have gone heavily into, into streaming, of course. Yeah. So we, under our, our I Wake Up Streaming column uh, <laughs> heading, we're, uh, we're telling people... Uh, about all these new streaming sites and giving an idea of what kind of content they can find there. But yeah. uh, we're, um, we, as I say in the editorial, we're committed to the best genre regardless of format. And we'll, and we'll start looking at streaming, and if it's coming out on uh, Blu-ray, fine. 
Uh, but if it, if the whole world goes to streaming and Blu-ray suddenly disappears, well, we'll just keep covering it in different format. Right. There'll be some crazy person that's still going to have their DVDs. It's like I have eight tracks, so you know it's the way. It is. <laughs> uh, you right. said mostly everybody's coming back now. We've got questions about Debbie Rashawn. Yes. Oh, I'm glad you you mentioned that. Debbie Rashawn has come back for the winter issue, and she wrote a wonderful article about the resurrection of a movie, uh, a Finley movie called Band, and she was instrumental in getting it uh, getting it seen again. This was Finley's last film, and it's quite a good piece she wrote, um, so that people can look forward to that. In fact, uh, we've received letters that say, um, that when I, on the relaunch, is Debbie Rashawn going to have her column, the, Rush, yeah. Rashawn, the Debbie Rashawn Report? So uh, I can please to tell people she's, she's in. Yeah. Um, Very good. I love her. She's wonderful. Oh, and I'll tell you who else we have. As you, as you well know, as told to Terry and Tiffany Defoe, we have uh, the Karen Allen interview in the winter issue. Yes, yeah. Which I was really, ha- I'm really happy that that's getting to run because that was for us. That is uh, kind of fulfilling the last thing that we worked on with Joe too. So that's how I feel about it too. Yeah. In yeah. fact, he uh, he had worked on that piece and he had told me it was ready to go, and I sh- and. In hindsight, I realized he he handed over to me uh, the work he had uh, thought up uh, quite a, quite a lot of the layouts and arrangement for the winter issue. When I thought about it, I realized these, I think he just assumed, and everyone assumes this: uh, things just keep going. Uh, and I realized uh, he had he had prepared uh, articles for a winter issue, and uh, we should do it. Now that that made it easy for you, a, a little easy. It had to still be hard. Uh, that he laid some of that out. What, was there anything in your progression through bringing us back that you found difficult to find, couldn't find, didn't know where he had put something or done something or how to access what you needed that he had left? No, uh, he was pretty good. He handed me <clears throat> he handed me a file <clears throat> and he said, "Here's uh, the beginnings of the next issue," uh, and we went through the pages together uh, and uh, and the pages that uh, that we could use for this issue we did use them and uh and then what was a little difficult to get rolling is when you start up again we were starting from scratch as to uh for 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 films to review we had to uh get back up to speed with our with getting them and and seeing getting getting in the rhythm of what's coming out to be as current as a quarterly can be uh we're a quarterly magazine so sometimes you know we're a month or so behind but but whatever we cover uh the reaction I've, we've gotten over the years from the readers is whatever we're covering, what people like is, unlike the Internet, when you have a print magazine, sometimes it's someone else has pre-selected articles for you yeah. and arranged topics that, that weren't part of your personal search. They right. just fall into your lap. And as you're just turning pages, suddenly you say, well, I didn't think about uh, this before. I, this is this, this is interesting to me. Never in a million years would I be thinking about this or even go to look for it. But here it is, so let yeah. me read it. This right. is interesting. Exactly. That's part of the fun of a print magazine. Yeah. I've, I've got to know, did you and Joe ever have a conversation to where you expressed what you wanted if one of you went before the other, as far as the magazine keeping it alive? Uh, no, I'll tell you, I'll tell you uh, uh, about us. Uh, uh, Joe worked all the time, and he worked uh, up until the moment of his death, I believe. And, uh, he worked uh, all the time, and the feeling was, um, I think his attitude was, um, the work is here, and um, it's going to keep going, and yeah. somehow you'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But uh, um, I'm very pleased to be able to pick this up and to keep this going. I feel... Uh, I feel this issue is very solid. Uh, it's not exactly the way Joe would do it, but I think uh, if he were to see it, I think it, I think it would meet his standards. And that's the that's the best thing I can say about the relaunch: that people will be, uh, I, I'm, I believe, people will be very pleased to see the variety, and of course, the quality of our writing is excellent. Our writers really do a superb job. Yeah. Uh, one more question from the listening audience. This kind of goes back to what we were talking about and mentioning uh, Joe's Night of the Living Dead book. Uh, but it, are you only planning, and I, 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 I'm not trying to d- demunitize this, it, Videoscope, re- relaunching Videoscope is a huge undertaking. But the question is, uh, are you only looking at relaunching Videoscope or have you looked at possibly reissuing some of Joe's old books that are out of print? 
Well, um, um, the books that are out of print, which would be The Night of the Living Dead, uh, which I know is out of print, and his, uh, I believe his two big review books, mm-hmm. uh, which were very influential when they came out and are still used for reference t- to this day. Yes, yes. Um, uh, they are also out of print. Now, the problem with those is... Uh, I don't believe that we have the rights to reprint them ourselves. We would have to go to the publisher or mm-hmm. whoever has since bought out the various, you know, with mergers and acquisitions. Mm-hmm. So, unfortunately, th- those books, I, uh, I, w- that's possibly why None of the Living Dead is five hundred dollars <laughs> online, uh, because <laughs> that I'm still, I'm still trying to digest. Now, the books that Joe, uh, his found footage book, and some of his other books. Uh, they are available in paperback edition and Kindle edition on Amazon. Mm. And uh, he did do a cult film. We did a, cult, a Videoscope Cult Film Confidential series. Yes. Uh, he did the first one called Masters of Midnight, which was interviews with, fil- with filmmakers. And then I did uh, two on Art House, and I just did a third. And we're going to, uh, they'll all be available uh, and, and talked about in an ad in the uh, Winter Video Scope. So that series is available online, you know, from Amazon. And mm-hmm. you can get the paper paperback. Um, but it is uh, it is also wonderful. Uh, so many people have said that it, Joe's uh, video books uh, did so much in, in terms of uh, people's enjoyment of film, where they could find film. And it also has, I've received letters where people have told me that reading Joe influenced them and gave them the confidence to launch their own uh, their own uh, film film uh, film cr- writing careers. Right. Well, it definitely was part of what launched Cult Radio, and that's for sure. That I can say for a fact. I wanted to find out. It wasn't too long ago that you put out a book. Uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about that book, and then also I want to know. Okay, you've always done video scope, but now you have to do the whole thing. The workload's got to be double on you. How is that going to uh, impede or maybe even help you writing other books by Nancy that is not Videoscope like you have been doing in the past? Well, that, that uh, yes. Um, I, what I'm thinking about Videoscope is once we, once I, we do one issue, uh, certain routines or, or ways of doing it, it, you know, putting out a magazine, it's like project management. You have right. to stay on top of the assignments and organize the pages and back and forth with the design and so forth. But I, I think it will get uh, manageable. And luckily, we're a quarterly. I, I couldn't imagine doing this more than four times a year. <laughs> and that was true. That was true when Joe and I were doing it together as well. And then um, uh, the other uh, career I've had is as a novelist. And that is very important to me. My most recent book is uh, Orphan of the Century. It's a, it's a big epic. I spent quite a uh, amount of time on it. Uh, Joe encouraged me uh, to do a rewrite and to finish it. I was very pleased that uh, he participated. He encouraged me, and uh, he told me sorrowfully that he wouldn't live to see it come out, but that he knew uh, that he he had read it, and he helped me with the editing of the last chapter. I read it to him. That that was uh, meaningful to me. Now, what I'd like to do is um, is continue with that. I'd uh, I'd like to r- to write something autobiographical, somewhat of a memoir of certain experiences I've had, like everybody does. Everybody uh, connected to film or connected to uh, being in New York at a certain time. Um, so I have some projects that I'd like to do. Uh, I'm really looking forward to that. Um, you know, initially after Joe died, I, I, I was extremely busy, uh, uh, by which I mean uh, dealing with the magazine, dealing with uh, his uh, papers and trying to find a home for it, dealing with everything else. And oh, uh, my writing, uh, the thinking of writing was sort of uh, on hold. And I think then what happens is things get more organized in terms of time and reflection, and I'm looking forward to uh, to uh, to writing. I, I I love it. Both that's one thing. Uh, Joe Joe and I both uh, shared. We shared uh, three things. One is um, we shared similar taste in movies, uh, which is terrific because um, we just like the same stuff. And right. he introduced me to to so many things, and I like that too. Uh, we we were able to work together, which is very difficult. We knew how to be alone together, which is necessary if you want to write. Absolutely. And we were comfortable with it. Yeah. Yes. 
we were very comfortable with that. And then we were comfortable with with uh, our companionship while giving each other space to 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 do what was necessary uh, to get it out of yourself, to think, to reflect, and then to to you know, the way the writing works. The, the way I know it is, you write a lot of things. You need time. You need a lot of time to do nothing, to think of something, mm-hmm. and then you need a lot of time sometimes to write it badly in order to correct it to get it right. right. And so we both knew that and were patient with the process and patient with each other. And the third thing, we, as I said before, what we like to do was we like Chinese food and we would like to go to movies <laughs> and eat Chinese food. <laughs> yeah. Let me ask you this. Uh, this is a, a question that will take a little thought. You may not even be able to answer it. You know, in, in the background, okay, uh, the two greatest shocks I ever got was the first email from you saying he had left the second greatest shock uh was when you said you were relaunching now at first you had the first initial normal reaction which is that last issue will be the last issue now you're dwelling and and diving into it full force and and it's, it's a beautiful thing i wanted so bad as i'm saying this with a little emotion for you to bring it back but that was your decision and something you had to do. What was the deciding factor that brought you from saying it would end with Joe's last issue to I need to do this? Well, um, I felt that uh, I missed it. You know, here's what happened. Uh, after Joe died, it was uh, it's like everyone who's had a loss. Yeah. Um, it's just a terrible void. Um, I think even uh, President Biden, who mourns his son constantly, he talks about the silence. It's like yeah. you're looking for this person, and it's death is incomprehensible. It's like, what, did you leave somebody at the supermarket or something mm-hmm. that you, they're going to come? I mean, you just don't understand where they, they're, they're here, but they're not here. And then and you, you, you get confused where you think you're out of the house and you're going to come home and, and the rhythms and, and the person's going to be there and life is going to resume. And it's kind of a shock constantly to be reminded that that loss is something that's incomprehensible. And yeah. you, that, for me, once you wrap your mind around that this is difficult to understand for everybody, it's just something that you live with. And then you realize that someone's presence is, is here. Right. But um, I began to, um, to think that um, uh, w- during that awful time uh, I would sit in the living room and uh, I was depressed because no new movies were coming. Generally we would get packages every day. Somebody was sending some film and I was getting accustomed to thinking um, I'm going to have to think up some new outlets for my viewing and find get uh, find stuff to see. And while I'm thinking this, we have a lot of um, Blu-rays just lying around the house. <laughs> I, I, I hear They're you. Just, <laughs> yeah. uh, I don't know what other people's the, uh, people's houses are like. I've been in them, and I'm shocked that they look like they're pristine. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And um, we just have uh, piles and piles of Blu-rays, yep. and while um, and DVDs, and there and ra- we would buy racks, and we would say this would solve the problem, and then the racks would get filled, <laughs> and we'd buy new racks. <laughs> So while I'm doing this, I'm looking at Dog Day Afternoon, and I finished it, and I couldn't help myself. I picked up a, a yellow pad, and I started to take notes as if I was going to review it. And then I looked at the extras, sat down, and I said, what a pity, I'm not going to write this review. And I thought about that, and the more I thought about it, I realized I need an outlet so I can, I can. Tutorial video scope is, it's once you get the view and a viewpoint, you can't help but want to share it or talk about it or get it down. And uh, once I, I thought about Dog Day Afternoon, I thought, i got to review it. I'm going to review it for reeling back and stick it in the winter issue, and in that way we're going to have a winter issue. If that's, that's what it takes, then we're going to start the whole thing up again because I'm just like one of the writers. I'm missing it. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's like cult radio. How many times have I said, I'm going to retire, I can't keep doing this? You can't quit because it's a living, breathing entity that becomes part of you. you th- and yeah. furthermore... Uh, it becomes part of you in the sense that uh, it's it's the work or the, the let's not call it the work because when you say work people think like oh work it's something you want to shirk right. you want to run away from work yeah. it's not work it's involvement and yeah. the involvement is so is so uh, entertaining so encompassing that without it you you would you would ask yourself what why why am I here and what am I doing yeah. Yeah. It gives you a purpose for sure. I'm asking stuff. We we still oh. cherish our old shirts that Joe gave us, the Phantom shirts. 
and I guess you want to do something like that, some type of merch uh, shirts. Well, whatever. you know, I would all, always talk to Joe. Um, I'd say to Joe, you know, what about T-shirts again? He said, oh, <laughs> he said, I got to finish. I got to do the editorial. I got to write this. Oh. Then I would say to him, you know, um, you know what would be wonderful to have? What if we had our own video scope coffee mug? Oh, I got to write the editorial. <laughs> leave me, leave oh. me. Uh, but but uh, having said that, when you suggested uh, merchandise, mm-hmm. I I am very excited about T-shirts and coffee mugs. Yes, yes. Pe- especially coffee mugs. There's something about a coffee mug. Uh, it sits on the desk, whether you drink from it or put pencils in it, it's, it's there. It's, it's just like you're part of the club. Right. And uh, 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 so uh, once we get into the new year, yes, we're going to do mugs and, and T-shirts for sure. And, uh, and hopefully people will, will uh, like to get a Videoscope mug. So once again, when is the new issue coming out? How can I get it? Same old usual places, of course, Barnes & Noble. Ours is left uh, in existence. Uh, tell everybody the who, what, when, and where. Well, I have to tell Nancy, when Terry started writing for Videoscope, I don't think you've ever told her this. What? When Terry started writing for Videoscope, he was so excited to appear in the pages of Videoscope that for like the first couple of issues, every time an issue would come out where he had an article in it, he would go to Barnes & Noble, find the issues of Videoscope, and put them in front of all of the other magazines. It would be like a whole row of just Videoscope as the first magazine in front of all the other, in front of Fangoria, yeah. in front of Psychotronic. I, I, would, I, would, I, would, I, would hide, I would hide Fangoria and put Videoscope in front because that's well, what I Well, I, I think that's terrific, but, <laughs> but you'll, agree, uh, you'll agree that um, uh, once you appear in a print magazine with a byline, mm-hmm. there's something about that that is just so electric and if you're a writer it's addictive we once you start you, you've just got to keep going you want to be in publication you want to be in print yes uh, writers feel that way i feel that way and uh, a, a magazine with a personality uh and a subject matter and a history like ours with an iconic look and style it's just the best thing ever yes we used yeah. to go to parties in las vegas hanging out with the cool guys there were people there that knew us from the magazine because they read our stuff. I couldn't believe that. Just out That's of wonderful. nowhere, you know, and I was walking the streets of, of Los Angeles one day, and I looked down, and I don't even know why I was on the ground, there was a, a page torn from an issue of Videoscope just laying there right in front of me. I'm like, wow. Mm. Um, one of our avid readers. But to tell you where, when, where, and how, yes. uh, the, re- the on-sale date uh, is January 14th, it's in over 600 Barnes and Nobles. Uh, it's also through the southeast in a chain called Books a Million, mm. uh, and we're in some smaller uh, independent chains. Now, if you can't find it in the Barnes and Noble near you, you should contact us at videoscopemag.com because you can buy a single issue from us, or you can buy a subscription, which is thirty-five dollars for four issues. Um, but if you just want to buy one issue, the current issue, buy as you go along, you can do that too and we'll mail it to you. And of course, if you subscribe, it's periodicals postage, it comes to you in the mail. Perfect. There Perfect. you go. Well, uh, as we wrap this up, Nancy, I want to thank you so much for not only spending some time with us on, on this holiday weekend and staying up late to do so, but also, more importantly, and from mm-hmm. the very bottom of our hearts, I can't express this. There, there are no words to express it. You brought us. You brought us out of retirement. Yeah, we sincerely would oh. not have written for anybody we, else. Terry and I spoke. What a wonderful thing to hear! Yeah. What a wonderful thing to hear! And I want to tell you, uh, I'm just delighted uh, for, with your participation and contribution over the years. You've added something to Video Scope. The interviews are fantastic. And uh, we're, I'm looking forward to just let's just let's all of us just keep going like the rolling like Mick Jagger says let's just keep <laughs> going as long as we can. I agree. I agree. So uh, the the street date is January 14th for you guys to place an order. Of course, you can get all the information and even subscribe, which you guys should do by going to videoscopemag.com. And uh, Nancy, thank you so much for for being with us tonight. And uh, oh, as I've told you before, we're at your disposal. And I don't know how much you believe in in uh, spirit. He is. He's there. Yeah. I tell you, as I said, it's his vision that we're that's in the magazine, and his his spirit is in here. Yeah, absolutely. 
All right. You too. Happy New Year. Have a great rest of the weekend. Take care of yourself, boss. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank right. you. Yes. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye now. Bye-bye.